Moving on, we're going straight in order, correct? Okay, so our next presentation is Jane Peterson um, uh, giving a program update on the human heredity and health, speaking of Africa, uh, the H3 Africa project. Can I take this stick out? I have no idea. Oh, what will happen? Yeah, that's just good. What's the worst that's going to happen? It'll say you should have yeah, removed right. it. Oh. Where's um, here? Our computer. Where's my where is my computer? It's up here. Right oh, there. way up there. There you go. Here we go. Up in the E. Is that yours? If not, we'll no, do the next one. Go back. There you go. All right, um, I'm going to give you an overview um, about this program you've heard about, but I don't think you, we've ever given you a presentation about it. It's a Human Heredity and Health in Africa, H3 Africa. Um, and this is a program, uh, this is a common combination of a common fund and institute uh, funded program. Uh, how am I supposed to go forward? How do I advance it? Oh, there I did. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. So, as I said, this is a common fund um, initiated program, uh, and actually, it grew out of the um, NHGRI um, interest uh, generated by Dr. Charles Rotimi, who is a um, intramural investigator in NHGRI, and then, of course, Francis has had an interest in this. So, I'll tell you a little bit more about where it came from in a minute. But they recognize that there is a need for a genomics initiative in Africa. Genetics and genomics in Africa is really very sparse. Um, and other reasons that we were that they were interested in in starting this um, type of a program is the incredible uh, disproportionate burden of communicable diseases in Africa, and of course HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria dominate the research that's being done there. Uh, there has been in recently an emergence of the prevalence of um, non-communicable diseases, which has gone really pretty much unstudied in the continent. And we believe that genomics is key to the contemporary biomedical research um, that can be done on the continent. So um, in order to address this um, need, um, there, there was a group of uh, meetings, a set of meetings that I'll tell you about a little in a minute. Um, from which came a working group of scientists on the continent as well as um, U.S. and British scientists or European scientists um, that put together a white paper and um, they identified genomics research as an important area that needed to be expanded in Africa. Um, there was uh, collaboration with African scientists at the time, but it was limited and oftentimes the African scientists didn't get the credit that uh, everyone felt needed to be that they should get. And then also there's, uh, you may be aware, looking around our universities, that there is a considerable uh, brain drain going on in Africa. Um, many uh, students come from Africa to be educated in the U.S. and they don't go back to Africa very often. And if they are um, trained in Africa, they very often get snapped up by um, North, as they call the U.S. and Europe, Northern universities. Um, Africa also presents some unique research opportunities. Uh, African populations have the most genetic diversity. I don't need to tell this audience that. It's a unique place to study gene-environment interactions because over the entire continent, there are so many different environments. And uh, data on Africans are needed to achieve better ancestral representation in genomic studies. The number of 
of um, African populations that have been tested so far as part of the HapMap and Thousand Genomes and other programs is um, not is very small compared to the Caucasian populations and not re representative of the diversity that exists in Africa. So the H3 Africa initiative is intended to encourage contemporary research approach by African investigators to study genetic and or environmental determinants of common diseases in Africa with the goal of improving health of African populations. The goals of the program are to increase the number of African scientists that are internationally competitive in genomics and population research, to establish collaborative networks of Africans um, pursuing genomic-based research and disease-oriented projects. Um, I'll mention this several times in my talk, but collaboration in Africa between universities or between countries is very rare, and this is one of the things that we really want to try to change or start to change. And then also we want to create and expand infrastructure for genomics research, particularly bioinformatics and biorepositories. You'll see as I go on that we don't have very much money to accomplish these goals, and building upon existing infrastructure is really critical. So thus far, what have we done? Um, we, Mark Geyer and I visited um, several places more than this, but these are four labs in Africa that we visited last March. Um, in Nigeria, we saw a nascent biorepository being set up. You can see that the freezers are out, um, but there are also a lot of boxes sitting there. Um, so a biorepository is one of the uh, initiatives that we really want to get going. And this group has been funded by the University of Maryland, actually, to put um, a biorepository in place for a project that they were working on. In Tanzania, we visited a, a Julie Makani's lab, where we um, saw a significant amount of effort um, on sickle cell disease. And this is um, a representative of one of their workstations. In Mali, we uh, visited an NIAID-supported research lab that works on malaria. They also took us out to a number of villages, uh, which was really interesting, but this, this lab has been very well equipped by NIID over, I think it's 10 or more years. And then in South Africa, we visited the South African National Bioinformatics Institute, and that's Alan Christoffel sitting there, standing there, uh, in front of their server room, which is fuller than it looks from this picture. But um, we were very impressed that um, the University of West Cape had set Alan up in this beautiful facility um, for training in bio bioinformatics and in recruiting people and in developing programs, et cetera. So um, while we recognize that this, the, uh, from our visit that the conditions for research in Africa are not the same as what they are in the United States, South Africa certainly comes closer than the other um, countries, but there is significant infrastructure and there certainly is the brain power and the interest uh, to do a genomics project in Africa. Um, the other, I mentioned earlier that there's been a number of, of meetings. The program was, was launched in 2010 with a press release that um, had Eric and Francis, oops, sorry. Eric and Francis, Charles Rotimi, and um, Dr. Maiosi from the University of Cape Town and uh, Mark Walport in London. Um, the working groups I mentioned earlier got together for a final meeting in uh, fall of that year, and um, this was in uh, Cambridge, and developed this white paper, which was then published in 2011. And then um, the first H3 Africa, this, this was, well, this first H3 Africa post white paper meeting was held in Cape Town. Uh, actually, Mark and I went there at the end of our set of site visits. And that meeting ratified this white paper, which is on the H3 Africa website if you want to look at it. So the, the major thing we've been doing in this last year is writing uh, concept after concept, defense after defense of the program, and then um, uh, RFAs. So we have... Um, spent a lot of time refining these ideas and finally getting them published as RFAs in the last month. So the, their initiatives are a set of collaborative projects which 
have multiple components represented by this, this little um, jigsaw puzzle that will work together to, to implement and uh, train uh, in gen genomics and genetics environmental research on the continent and to um, promote collaboration. Research projects are individual uh, investigator initiated projects that will be an outgrowth of an existing ongoing NIH or other funding agency project um, that will bring genetics and genomics to that already funded project. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. The bioinformatics network is a network of labs within the continent, uh, around the continent, that are interested in working together to train and to spread information and about the program, as well as to build up the infrastructure for bioinformatics all over the continent. It will also tie together these uh, research projects here. The biorepository initiative is an initiative to establish a biorepository, either one or two, on the continent that will be a site where H3Africa samples will reside so that Africans have more control or more uh, ability to make decisions about what happens to their samples. And then societal implications research is um, introducing uh, LC type grants into the African continent where some training in this has already happened. So key aspects of all these initiatives will be that the awards will be made directly to African institutes and PIs. The centers will, um, the, the, these are the collaborative centers I mentioned, will comprise multiple collaborative projects. So the idea here again is to have these be relatively large projects that will collaborate outside of their own institutions and hopefully internationally. Um, and I should say that the U.S. can be partners in these projects, but more than 51 percent of the funds must flow to African institutions. The research project grants will add a genomic lens to pre-existing projects, as I said a moment ago. The, all of the projects must deposit samples in the H3Africa biorepositories. They must use the H3Africa bioinformatics network for training, for information, for help with what's going on in their laboratories. They must include a training program, and they may include societal implications research. Now, these are the initiatives, um, one by one. The biorepository, as I said, is a, comes from a strong desire to have African scientists re retain control of their samples. Um, the program is going to start with a two-year feasibility study, uh, and that, that after that feasibility study, it will be evaluated, and some of those projects will be funded for full-scale repositories over the next five years. So it's a seven-year program. The bioinformatics network, it will be a foundation for bioinformatics capacity across Africa. It will foster connectivity and interactivity certainly within the H3Africa grantees, which um, I forgot to mention, will also include Wellcome Trust grantees. This is a joint project between Wellcome Trust and uh, NIH. And it will provide training in bioinformatics and promote computational skills among African researchers. Um, the societal implications research will provide support for independent researchers. Um, we felt that this was not ready for prime time yet, so we didn't put out an RFA this year. Instead, um, there will be a societal implications research meeting in Abuja, Nigeria in um, November, November, I believe. And uh, from that, we will um, be talking with researchers who, who are interested in submitting applications and help them understand what needs to be in an application and what kinds of, of problems, uh, questions uh, would be of interest to H3Africa. And then uh, the, the Societal Implications Program will also encourage the H3Africa Consortium in developing its own policies. So the H3Africa timeline, um, we have already released most of the FOAs or RFAs that will be um, considered for funding in FY12. These are the collaborative centers I told you about the research projects, the bioinformatics network, the biorepository feasibility studies, 
uh, in September 2011, uh, just next week. Mark and I will, and several other NHGRI uh, staff as well as NIH staff will be traveling to Nairobi, Kenya for an application, applicant information session, which will also be available by uh, webinar and conference call. Um, in no November, the, we will have this uh, ethics and genomics research conference in Abuja. Uh, no, yes, <laughs> I think I said Bamako before, Abuja, Nigeria. And then in December 2011, the applications are due. The, they will be reviewed in March of next year. And by July, we hope to fund the center's research projects, the bioinformatics network, and the biorepositories. Then the societal implication research RFAs will be uh, released in FY13. Uh, Any questions? That's great. Great. I, I had a question about the societal implications research meeting in Nigeria. Um, who has been invited to the meeting? And you plan a subsequent uh, request for proposal. What efforts will be made to ensure that maybe a broader array of, of persons other than those directly involved with the initiative um, are aware of and, and have opportunities to be engaged? Um, I'm going to turn to Jean McEwen, who is running this part of the program. It's not on, Jean. The meeting um, is is actually being broadly advertised, and it'll be really open to anyone uh, within the continent of Africa who has an interest in this. Um, with uh, there are, there are going to be some funds uh, provided for sort of um, for some reimbursement of travel funds. There's actually a number of people um, who have uh, already done research on various um, issues in bioethics, largely funded through the Fogarty um, Bioethics Training Initiatives. Um, so a lot of, the, of those people will be involved, as well as just others who are, are generally interested in the area. And I think, you know, the real purpose of the meeting actually is really to hear from them about um, their thoughts about what should go into uh, the research agenda for this initiative in terms of the societal implications, um, not just sort of our coming in and telling them what we think the questions are, but really to learn from them. That, yeah. Um, I should also say that we have a fairly extensive mailing list, and uh, we would welcome any suggestions of names that you would want us to send all the information to. Everything that I talked about, everything that uh, we have done is posted on the H3Africa website, which is h3africa.org. Um, so we're trying to get the word out as broadly as we possibly can. Pilar? Um, so I want to start by saying I think this is a, a great idea, great program. Love the fact that you know it's it's directed towards African investigators and um, and empowering them to to do genomic science. I think that's fantastic. And one of the things I've said to Eric is, when H three Latin America or South India, uh, you know Southeast Asia coming. Um, the other question I have though is for U S based investigators that want to work in Africa. You know, all of us have gotten, oh, look at this H3 Africa. You should be applying for this. This is great. And it's obviously, guys, this isn't for us. It's for the African-based investigators to get, you know, their resources in line so that they can compete on an international stage. But it does raise the question about 
what is being thought about in terms of U.S.-based investigators for the reason that if you, one could imagine grants going through regular study sections saying, well, shouldn't this really be funded by H3 Africa, given all the impetus that's being put out there and the sort of misunderstanding that it's, it's actually not for U.S.-based investigators? I was thinking we had a budget slide on here and um, some of the other presentations I've been working on for next week. Um, this, this is funded at a level of about... Um, I think the first year is eight million dollars, so there's very little money in it. It goes up to about ten million dollars as the years advance. So that's one answer: <laughs> is H3 Africa is not very big, um, and so um, it really is a token to try to get African researchers started and to be, as you said, competitive. Um, most of the grants and contracts funded in Africa are already to American investigators and the subcontracts are African. So you are free to um, submit applications as you want uh, as they um, apply to infectious disease or not or you know or whatever in, uh, science of interest you want to do in Africa. Um, at this point I would say there's probably not a groundswell to have an actual RFA for that. But H3 Africa, as I said, 51% has to go to Africa. I am quite sure that multiple of these investigators will subcontract back to the U.S. So I would suggest that if you, you know someone, know something you're On the contrary, I mean, I actually think, you, you know, it would not, it, I think it, it, the point wasn't how do we sort of tap in and get some H3 Africa money. On the contrary, wouldn't it be great to figure out a vehicle yes. by which H3 Africa funded investigators can, because it is such a small amount of money, network with all the people who are already funded and create a sort of larger impetus for making that happen. Well, that would be great. I, I think, and, and particularly your point about uh, the unintended consequence yeah. of an H3 effort, it's a good, very good point. I, I don't personally haven't thought about it before, but uh, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, On that point, let me just, you might want to talk to folks at NIMH. They developed um, collaborative projects primarily around HIV with both India and South Africa. I, I was doing other NIMH-funded research in South Africa at the time, so I was aware of, of, of what they were doing, where they, they brought groups of U.S.-based researchers with the local researchers and had a research meeting discussing the issues, and out of which the desire was for collaborative projects to grow. And I think both the India and South African experience work very well in stimulating a lot of research there in those we, two countries. We have talked to NIMH, and they are one of the participants. Well, they're not a direct participant. They are funding a, um, it may be one of these collaborative projects. I don't, I don't think about. it's been reviewed yet, but, okay. they're, but they, they're, are they are very interested in, um, in, in supporting a, a project of this sort in their area of interest, and assuming it gets funded, we'll brought, bring it in. So that... We, we intend that the H3Africa umbrella <clears throat> encompass any research project and research group that is interested in this area, not only the ones that are directly funded by, uh, by, by H3Africa. In fact, some of the most uh, sophisticated research going on in Africa is in agriculture. And we expect that there will be groups interested in agriculture that join the bioinformatics network. And you mentioned just sort of in passing that you had spent a lot of time defending this uh, program. Would you like to say a little bit well, more? Like to whom, who, who is concerned about it or against whom are you defending? There, there's been concern at the level of sending money outside the United States. Uh, concern about sustainability, which is completely legitimate. Uh, concern about, um, you know, will will we be able to establish something, especially the biorepository, in a way that it can actually uh, um, support itself when NIH leaves? So I think um, I think we've uh, allayed most of those concerns. And we feel like we're in a good situation going forward. But I have to say that the amount of funding makes it makes it more difficult. Although we have successfully um, encouraged 
and, uh, and gotten the uh, common fund to give us a small amount of additional funds. So. I mean, the other thing to add to it is it became clear from our early discussions around the NIH on the best use of the common fund money was to, as Jane described, put this towards infrastructure and hope that institutes would come in and do specific scientific projects in disease areas of interest. And so you would sort of have matching money. And, um, and we went around the three of us, Mark, Jane, and I, hours and hours of times of meetings with each, you know, 10 institutes or something, and we got warm, receptive, you know, uh, interactions with them. But when it really came time to commit dollars into, you know, to really, as opposed to, well, maybe someday, yeah, sure, we, you build it and we'll see later, we were, to be candid, a little disappointed with the number of commitments we were able to get. Admittedly, this is in the face of, you heard my budgetary discussion, so it's really, people are, and, you know, and some of these institutes have major commitments in Africa as it is, so they're sort of feeling like, well, we already have our own programs. That was what it was a little disappointing that we, it, but there's a lot of reasons for it, but we have enough to go forward and we're hoping that it'll create some momentum and then others will follow. Jane, at eight to 10 million per year NIH funding, and if so, what's the trust committed? The trust is about 12 million pounds over, we never know how many year, years eight, to say. 8 million pounds, 12 million dollars. 12 million dollars over um, three or five years. It's not clear yet. And their call is also out, their call for proposals. You can find it on the H3 Africa website. And it's um, being done at the same time ours is, being done slightly differently where they're, they kind of get pre-proposals and they select some of those and they do a rigorous review of that. Is there going to be some effort co at coordination between the two? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It's, in, the in terms of what is funded, I mean. Oh, yes. And, and applicants can, f can apply to both um, programs. And then at the time that we are ready to, once we know the, how they came out, we will talk together about uh, who should be funding what. And let, you know, it's like, NSF and NIH when we have joint proposals. Like the, that. This, the schedules for the Welcome Trust call and our solicitations were designed so that the funding decisions will be made at about the same time. Bill? Um, is there any thought about regional distribution of, of research funds or uh, since Africa is such a like diverse the bio place? Repository. Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, that's come up over and over again. Should we have regional bioinformatics? Should we have regional biorepositories? I think we have to see what we get in and what does well. And in the case of the biorepository, the ability of a biorepository to receive and distribute samples is going to trump anything else to some extent. Um, so yeah, there's been lots of talk about that. Certainly we in a perfect world, we would want to try to see that uh, the projects are well distributed, and I hope that's the way the applications come in, but we we really don't know yet. Bill, I think we were <clears throat> originally envisioning that the collaborative research centers would operate and, and form a regional nucleus for research. Interestingly enough, the um, the initial contacts we've had expressions of interest involve groups that are very widely distributed around the continent. Yeah, one of the things that that I'm sure you're hearing back is, is I am about from from the Africans that actually live in Africa, is that uh, they they would like to see a a non South African um, focus, um, but they're also quite concerned that most of the activity they're seeing is from people who no longer live in Africa, but are from there originally. And to the point where words like disgusting and other like have been used on a regular basis. And and um, one of the things that uh, Welcome is considering now is having not only a 51% rule, and maybe even ratcheting that down, but also making it so a certain percentage of the money has to be spent in Africa because of the worry that South Africans living in Canada will be getting the grants and really just using it as a trough, um, not as a real research tool. So I, there's a lot of sensitivity there. And I'm sure you're well aware of it. We were at the same meeting in, 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 uh, in Cape Town in March. And uh, there's a lot of expectations been built up because of H3 Africa by Africans. And if, if we end up funding uh, a bunch of people who used to be from Africa, 
um, it, it, there's going to be a lot of really pissed off people. Well, they can't be the PIs. First of all, no, but they, they can be an, they can be the largest snout. They can. Yeah. And um, certainly um, we'll see how the review group goes. Um, the, but I would think there might be a sensitivity to that, not only at the review level, but at the funding level. So uh, again, go ahead, Mark. Uh, again, Howard, I, the point is that these awards are going to be made directly to African institutions, not necessarily to scientists of African origin. They have to go to, to, the funds go to Africa, and then any decision about collaborations outside of Africa are made by the African investigators themselves by their choice. And before we go to the next question, Jane, you clarify, because the council is clear, showing significant interest in this, the grants will come to this council? Yes, uh, next May. So, so May of 2012. Yeah, and we'll we'll probably there'll be infectious diseases uh, grants and non-infectious disease, and as we need to, we'll we'll supplement with uh, people so, that can. So, so these those legitimate issues. concerns, you will have the ability to weigh in at a council yeah. level, which is terrific. Pearl. Yeah, I mean the bio repository seems so important. Um, is that a grant that will go to a specific institution, or is, will that be more of an umbrella one? My concern being, you have a you know, a continent where there's very different regulations. You have South Africa, which is tighter than we are. Um, you know, just what the governance, what the informed consent so, um, um, will be. Yeah, you know, this is this is a major, major issue in that RFA. Um, we hope to fund more than one. We hope geographically, those will be uh, spread out. They have to be able to receive and distribute samples. So, um, yeah, and we could receive a an application that proposed three sites around Africa, for example. That would be fine, um, and we'll make that clear, I guess, next week. I'm not sure it said that explicitly in the RFA. Um, so, it it is it is going to be a difficult thing to set up. That's why we're starting with planning grants so that we can set in place four different places that uh, we'll have to demonstrate what's feasible for them to do on the ground before we scale up into larger scale biorepositories. Jill? Yeah, Jane, maybe you mentioned this and I missed it, but oh, I, I just wonder how the, how, how the availability of these grants was publicized. I was I was in Dakar in March talking with some malaria collaborators of mine. There's there's also a group there working in HIV. They were completely unaware. Well, they're just uh, unpublished, to be fair. So I I understand, but I, what I'm what I'm worried about is how the word is going to get out beyond those few groups that are already in the know. Africa is a big country. Um, these, con sorry, <laughs> continent. You knew what I meant. Um, the, this particular, these particular groups that I met with in March. I mean, they are much less well equipped than the slides that you show, than the pictures that you just showed us, and could benefit tremendously by being involved. And I, I just worry that they'll never learn about these things. I mean. So first of all, give us their names. Okay. That's that's the first step. Um, we have collected. We've asked. We have the group of people who came to Cape Town. We have asked institutes to send out to any grantees that or any one they know on the continent. Uh, we've also just set up a. Where's Changi? Uh, what's the name of the site that the the social networking site? We can't hear you. Who's coming to the microphone? I mean, the the African Society of Human Genetics obviously sends out information to all of their members. Yeah, we have their entire mailing list. Right. Yes. So as Jane um, mentioned, we've sent it up to a lot of mailing lists, including the Welcome Trust mailing list, which is international. And last week we set up a social networking site on nature. Um, it's called Citable, and it's a collaborative research site where we already have over 20 members, which is really exciting, um, considering our site is only up for three days. 
And their PIs are actually already discussing, I'm interested in this FOA, I'm in Ghana. Is anyone else interested in joining us and maybe starting something in Kenya? And we can apply together for the FOA. Then we also have the meeting coming up in Kenya, which has also generated a lot of interest. So we, we're trying to do whatever we can think of. If you have any good ideas that we're missing, please let us know. And and, uh, and Jill, I think you, you raised a, an interesting important point about uh, groups that may be not as well set up as uh, groups that uh, as other groups and that that is a, a serious issue as to whether you f support groups that have already shown capability or whether you help other groups start out from scratch and we're trying to walk that line but the idea is that whatever gets funded we'll have to have an outreach component right. and we'll have to try we, uh, we we're hoping that this this relatively small program is going to be catalytic right and i mean at the very least you want to make sure that those less well equipped groups have the opportunity to connect through this vehicle that, with the that's better that's in part groups. what the the collaborative and, nature and of this is supposed and it to may encourage. may have to be a push rather than a pull from the well-equipped groups. Yeah, and I, I, I see the bioinformatics network as being a real key in reaching these groups that aren't very well equipped. They have enough money that they should be able to improve infrastructure in those sorts of sites. And um, we hope that we'll get a really active uh, PI institution that will really um, believe in this this mission and really push to coll to collaborate and connect to these remote sites. This has been great discussion. Any any last comments or questions? Okay, thank you for that input.